Good morning, everybody. Um, Our reading this morning is taken from Mark chapter 11, um, and we're going to be reading from verses 12 to 25. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, Forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. May God add his blessing to the reading and preaching of his word. Well, thank you, Brenda, very much indeed. And uh, a warm welcome, not just to you this morning, but also to the people who listen to these services on the live stream or um, through the YouTube channel or whatever it is. It was an encouragement to me this week to hear from somebody in England that we haven't seen for more than 20 years who's found their way to our website and has been joining us on our journey through Mark's Gospel. And of course we know that a number of our brothers and sisters in other African countries are listening. So a welcome to you if you're with us this morning. It would be a great help to me if you could keep the Bible open at Mark chapter 11 and the passage that Brenda has just read for us and you can follow along with me and first I'm going to ask for the Lord's help. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Heavenly Father we pray that your word would dwell among us this morning by your spirit, through your word. And we ask it for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, I read a rather extraordinary story this week of a family uh, whose cat (coughs) was stuck so far up a tree that they couldn't reach it. (coughs) So uh, the father, rather ingeniously, he lassoed a rope around the top of the tree and tied the other end to the bumper of his car and then began to drive away, the idea being to bend the tree over, which was fine until the rope broke and the cat was catapulted (laughs) through the air some distance uh, into a neighbour's garden (coughs) at the very same moment that a mother was telling her son that he could pray for a cat (laughs) but he shouldn't get his hopes up. Well, I don't know whether that really happened or not, but I tell you this because um, our text today has got this amazing promise in it, hasn't it, in verse 24. Uh, Can we all see verse 24 in our Bible? It says, uh, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. And that, of course, is a verse that's been used out of context to give the impression that... um, 
for the person with sufficient faith, prayer is rather like a blank check from Almighty God. Now last week we saw Jesus um, approaching Jerusalem uh, with crowds of people cheering, getting terribly excited, but who totally misunderstood his mission. And then this morning we come to the famous passage with the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. And Jesus uh, concludes the passage by speaking about prayer in really rather astonishing and extravagant ways. And the challenge before us is to try and figure out what this is really all about. Now, if you were listening carefully to the reading, you might have noticed that the, the business with the fig tree and what happens in the temple, um, those two things wrap around each other. So the passage begins with the fig tree, did you notice that? Then takes us into the temple, and then it goes back to the fig tree again. And I guess we could say, therefore, that the drama in the temple is kind of the meat in the sandwich, and the episode with the fig tree is the bread on either side. So we're going to look at the section under three headings this morning. Firstly, we'll consider the fruitless tree, verses 12 to 14. Then we'll look at the temple of robbers, verses 15 to 19. And then thirdly, I want us to think about uh, the test for faith in verses 20 to 25. So firstly then, the fruitless tree. So the morning after his arrival at Jerusalem, we're told in verse 12 Jesus was hungry. In verse 13, he sees a fig tree and he goes to look for some fruit. Uh, Please don't miss in passing that Mark tells us that the Son of God was hungry. Uh, In other parts of the Bible we're told he's thirsty and that he was tired. And uh, these are little texts reminding us that Jesus is both 100% God and he's 100% man. He experienced hunger and thirst and tiredness just like you and me. But so this particular fig tree has no fruit. Uh, It only has leaves. And although it wasn't the season for figs, in verse 14 we're told Jesus curses the fig tree. He says, doesn't he, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And we have to pause at this point and ask ourselves a number of questions. The first question would be, is it possible (coughs) that Jesus is ignorant of the seasons? Is he really expecting to find figs on the tree because he hasn't twigged, if you'll pardon the pun, that it is not the season for figs. Is that really a possibility? Or does he know perfectly well that it's not the season for figs, but when he can't find any figs on the tree, he loses his temper and he curses it? And I say that to you because uh, a number of famous people, Bertrand Russell among them, have argued this way because they find this part of the New Testament really rather offensive. And they've accused Jesus, can you believe it, of being bad-tempered and foolish. And then other Christians have looked at this passage and they've kind of tried to cover up what appears to be Jesus' bad behaviour by saying that fig trees, apparently, sometimes produce edible bumps on the branches before they produce the figs. And actually Jesus was after those and not the figs. Well, I hope that you're going to join me this morning in rejecting both of those approaches. Uh, We certainly don't need to attack what Jesus does here and we don't need to make excuses for him either. Why not? Well, because he's simply using the tree as a visual aid. That's what's happening. It was entirely natural for Jesus to be hungry But the fact of the matter is he wasn't just hungry for food for his body. He was also hungry for godliness amongst his people. Now that's what the whole passage is really all about. Jesus wants to see the fruit of godliness in his people. And that's what's going on in the temple as we'll see in a moment. 
And there's Old Testament precedent for this because in Micah 7, Micah chapter 7 in the Old Testament, you can look it up later, we're told that God craves figs and grapes. And the passage goes on to explain that God, in craving figs and grapes, is craving the godliness of his people. That's what Micah chapter 7 is all about. God wants his people to be fruitful. So last week we saw crowds of people waving their branches in chapter 11, uh, verse 8. But we saw last week that in fact they were all leaves and no fruit. And the people that Jesus is about to meet in the temple in verse 15 are also all leaves and no fruit. The fruit of godliness is missing in the people of God. So Jesus is not ignorant of the season for figs, of course not. And he's not bad-tempered and vindictive. He's an excellent teacher. And he's using the fig tree as a visual aid to teach us in the most memorable way that God looks for fruitfulness in his people. And people who can't see that and are critical of Jesus, well, they've simply missed the point. And uh, as an aside, the eco-warriors who get super sensitive about the tree need to realise that actually Jesus is way more interested in people than trees. In fact, if you cast your mind back to chapter 5, do you remember we saw that Jesus was willing to see an entire herd of pigs go over a cliff in order that just one person might be saved? And uh, remember, please, will you, that the entire sacrificial system in the temple was commanded by God, and it involved the sacrifice of thousands of animals. Why? Because God wanted to teach his people about the seriousness of sin and the wonder of forgiveness. So, to sacrifice one tree, let's agree, is a pretty small price to pay to make a really important point in an unforgettable way. Uh, The word that Jesus speaks to the tree in verse 14 is undoubtedly miraculous. It's actually the only destructive miracle in the Gospels, but it is a miracle. Uh, Jesus speaks to the tree in a way that you and I could not speak to a tree, and he causes it to be destroyed. And although it is a destructive miracle, Jesus does this because he loves us. Uh, Just like the prophets in the Old Testament who might perhaps shave their heads to make a point or break a pot to make a point or build a ramp or build a wall to make a point, here's Jesus making a point. God expects his people to bear fruit. So there we are, that's the first thing this morning, the fruitless tree. Secondly, we're looking at the temple of robbers, verses 15 to 19. And we're going to move fairly quickly here because I want us to spend a bit more time on the last verses in the passage which I think hold the key to the whole thing. This, of course, is a terribly famous scene, isn't it, where Jesus attacks the traders in the temple. Um, Children's Bibles will often have a picture of this because... It conveys, doesn't it, so clearly that Jesus is strong and he's courageous and really rather interesting. So he's nothing like the Jesus of popular imagination uh, who we sometimes see pictured with a flower in one hand and a lamb in the other. And in the process, Jesus describes the temple as a den of robbers. And uh, in case you don't know, This was actually the third temple in Jerusalem. Uh, So the first was Solomon's temple and that was destroyed by the Babylonians. That was then followed by Zerubbabel's temple, uh, which was much, much smaller than Solomon's temple. The Jews weren't terribly impressed with it when it was finished. So, when Herod the Great came to power in 37 BC, he wanted to please the Jews. And so he decided to start a major construction project to extend the temple and make it way more impressive. 
Uh, that building project went on for more than 40 years. And when it was finished, uh, the temple was a seriously impressive bit of construction. It was absolutely massive. Uh, apparently, if you wanted to wrap your arms around one of the columns in the temple, you needed to get three men linking arms before, in order to just get their arms around a single column. And uh, the court of the Gentiles, which is where this particular drama takes place in Mark 11, the court of the Gentiles, which was, remember, for worshippers who were not Jewish, well, it was huge. It was 35 acres. And it was common knowledge that if you wanted to bring 3,000 sheep to the temple in order to sell them for sacrifice, no problem, plenty of room. So the court of the Gentiles was an enormous area. There was plenty of room for legitimate business. And of course there's nothing wrong with legitimate business. Now, the temple permitted good business. Money had to be changed, uh, sacrifices had to be bought and sold. The temple couldn't actually function without those two business activities. They were perfectly legitimate. But what Jesus finds offensive is illegitimate business, meaning the kind of business that was frustrating the whole purpose of the temple. And you see, God was being forgotten. Uh, lost people from the surrounding nations were being forgotten and it was now all about the money. So, you see, while the temple had been designed to be a bridge between the nations and God, a place where outsiders could come and hear about God, find out about God, call out to God, get saved it had effectively become a vast shopping mall. I suppose rather like the waterfront or something. And the concern for the loss that the people were meant to have had been replaced by concern for profit. And the priority that people should be able to hear God's word and be saved, come to him in prayer, that vital access to God had been blocked and it was being blocked by greedy traders, or as Jesus calls them here, robbers. So Jesus attacked the trade, not because he was against legitimate business, and not because he lost his temper. No, Jesus attacked the trade because he loves lost people. He cursed the fig tree because he loves lost people. And he cleansed the temple because he loves lost people. And I also think that what Jesus did in the temple in Mark chapter 11, I think that also was miraculous. Because I don't see how one man could walk into a 35-acre market and single-handedly turn over all the tables and drive out the traders without getting arrested, without someone stopping him. I don't think you could do that unless you're the Son of God and unless you're demonstrating something of the righteous wrath of God against sin. And I think, if you cast your mind back to Revelation, which we studied a couple of years ago, I think this reminds us of Revelation chapter 6, where we're told that on the day of judgment, people will call out to the mountains and the rocks, saying, please cover us, because we're terrified of the wrath of the Lamb and we don't want to have to face it. Do you remember that? And here is Jesus acting in irresistible judgment against evil in God's holy temple. And friends, before you and I start to judge these traders and condemn whatever they were doing then, we this morning just need to pause and ask whether there's anything that we're doing which makes it more difficult for outsiders to come and hear God's word and call out to him and be saved. You see, one of the dangers facing the church in every age, and particularly, can I say, in conservative evangelical circles, 
is that the church will say, this is how we do things here and the people outside will just have to get on with it. At the other extreme, I think the other danger is that we will say, well look, if people out there will only take the trouble to watch my life, they'll see that I live by a different set of priorities and that will be enough to wake them up. But friends, the message of this passage is that you and I are meant to be thinking about the person who is trying to find their way to God. And in our lives during the week, we are to help outsiders by being a bridge to faith in Christ rather than being a barrier. Let me tell you about Alice Cooper. You didn't think you were going to hear about Alice Cooper this morning, did you? Alice Cooper was one of the really bad boys of the rock scene in the 1970s and 80s. And I discovered recently that apparently Alice Cooper has become, in his own words, a born-again Christian. Rather amazing. His father was a pastor, his grandfather was an evangelist. I guess his family must have spent decades on their knees while Alice Cooper was kind of finding his way through a really dark valley. But he's obviously come back. And he's come back across the bridge of Christ. And just as an aside, I discovered that these days he spends his time playing golf off off a handicap of four. So he's um, sorted himself out. But you see, the point is, I imagine, I imagine that he heard about Christ from his father and his grandfather. And the reason I'm telling you this is because if Alice Cooper can come to Christ, well, anybody can. Anybody can. And for those of us this morning who are waiting for loved ones who've lost their way to wake up and come to Christ, you and I can take heart, not from Alice Cooper, but from the heart of Jesus to save the lost, demonstrated in the cleansing of the temple. Now you see, I think that the whole of the section that we're studying together this morning is all about access. That's the big word. The temple section in the middle is about whether the people we meet during the week have got free access, unrestricted access to hear the word of God, to call out to him and be saved. And I think the cursing of the fig tree is symbolic of the people of God not bearing the fruit of God and showing no interest whatsoever in making it easy for outsiders to get access to God. And as we come to the last section now, verses 20 to 25, under the heading, The Test of Faith, I think these verses are also about access. And I want to invite you this morning to apply your own mind to this and decide for yourself whether you think I'm on the right track here or not. Now the thing to remember here, I think, in verse 20 is that the next morning as they go past the fig tree that's been cursed they discover that the fig tree has been destroyed now notice the phrase to the roots And I kept asking myself during the week, what on earth was the point of destroying it to the roots? I mean, why not just blast the leaves and leave it at that? But Jesus, Mark tells us, destroys the tree to the roots. And I think the point is that the roots of the people of God were dead. Their faith was in something other than God. And that's why in verse 22, Jesus turns from the tree to the disciples and he says to them, have faith in God. The people in the temple are rotten. They're not alive. And uh, in effect, Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to be alive. You need to have faith in God. So don't be the kind of person whose roots are tapping into something different. Make sure that the roots of your life are in God. And that's why Jesus goes on to say in verse 23, if you do have faith in God, you can speak to this mountain and say, jump into the sea and it'll jump into the sea. 
Whatever does he mean? Well, some of the experts say that he's referring to a passage in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah because in Zechariah chapter 14 uh, there's a prediction that a day is coming when uh, the Mount of Olives will be flattened uh, or made into a plain in order to make a way for God to come to Jerusalem in judgment. Some people think that's what Jesus is referring to there. So he could be saying, have faith in God because even this mountain can be flattened for the coming of the Messiah, that's me. I suspect, however, that Jesus is saying something rather simpler. I think he's saying that when you put your trust in God, you will be wanting to remove all the barriers that might prevent other people from coming to Christ. And your prayer life, in verse 24, is going to be about things which interest God, including removing the barriers. And in your heart, in verse 25, when it comes to thinking about other people, there will be the removing of barriers, which is one of the reasons why we say at Holy Communion, don't take the Lord's Supper if you're out of fellowship with someone in the church. See, God is interested in the barriers being removed. And I think this section is all about access to God and those barriers being taken away. And of course, in light of coronavirus and all of the restrictions, this is a text for today, isn't it? Can you see that? Therefore, we need to realise, friends, that the episode with the fig tree and the episode in the temple are not kind of random verses that Marcus stuck here because he didn't know where else to put them. Because once Jesus has cursed the fig tree and cleared the temple, he comes to the crunch point, which is to ask the disciples, what sort of people are you? Are your roots in God? Or are they in something else? Is his business your business? Or is your business your business? Because his business is the removal of barriers and the hearing of prayers. And that's what I think verses 23 to 25 are all about. And so, if that's right, it's good for me to ask myself and for you to ask yourself, are my roots in God or am I just pretending? One of the signs that your roots are in God is that there'll be a new life, a new vitality surging through you and this new life surging through you will mean that you're going to be bearing the fruit that pleases God and the fruits that please God are his business and his business is access. Access to him. Access to his fellowship, access to the church, access for lost people. So this is the question for us this morning, isn't it? What kind of tree are we in St Barnabas? Are our roots in God? Are the fruits the fruits of access to God? Or is there some other kind of life at work in us which has got nothing to do with God and nothing to do with God's business. You see, these temple traders didn't need a little homily from Jesus about not getting too busy. And uh, they don't need a little lesson from Jesus telling them not to give their lives to money and success. They've heard all those sermons. Because Jesus here is doing something way more radical. This is a radical intervention. Jesus is going for the roots. Some of you know that the reformer Martin Luther almost single-handedly uh, recovered the gospel for the church in the 16th century. And Luther had um, a rather difficult acquaintance called Erasmus. And uh, one of the reasons that Erasmus was rather difficult was because he had a very shallow view of sin. Uh, Erasmus took the view that our problem as human beings essentially is that we're just silly. Uh, he said that human beings are free to do whatever you want to do. Um, we're free to do good. 
we're able to do good, uh, we don't always because we're just a bit silly. And Erasmus wrote a book called The Freedom of the Will, in which he says just that, you're free to live as you please, but try not to make too many dumb mistakes. And Martin Luther saw that this was actually a tremendous threat to the Gospel. Because if the problem in the human race is shallow, we're just silly, well then our need of Christ is shallow. But because Martin Luther knows or knew that our problem is actually extremely deep, that left to ourselves, our roots will die and eventually we will die, and therefore the solution provided by Jesus is profound and wonderful, Luther wrote his own book called The Bondage of the Will to teach the world that without Christ we are enslaved to sin and we're under God's wrath. That's the message of the New Testament, of course. And that's why Jesus, in this section, is dealing with the roots of the problem. It is, I think, a very remarkable passage. It begins with a shock, cursing a tree because the people of God are behaving like dead people. Their roots are dead, they've got no fruit. But then Jesus turns to the believers around him and he says, make sure that your faith is in God. Make sure that you are planted in Christ. And if you've heard the Gospel, make sure you've come to him in prayer and you have said to him, please give me a brand new life so that the roots are new and the fruit is new and your business is my business. That's what Jesus is really saying in this passage. And when you are made new, his life will be your life and increasingly through time, his business will be your business. I expect some of you uh, younger folk, when you go to the gym or go for a run or whatever it is, you use a heart monitor. And uh, you know, don't you, that the purpose of a heart monitor is to give you feedback on the condition of your heart. I'm far too old to use one of those these days. But Mark 11, you see, is actually a heart monitor, isn't it? It's saying, is your trust in Christ to save you? And I guess most of you will say, well, yes, Simon, of course it is. Well, if that is what you would say, in the next 24 hours, you need to ask, do I find myself thanking him for giving me access to God through Christ? Do I find myself thanking God for giving me access to other believers in the fellowship of a local church? Do I find myself thinking I am genuinely, genuinely concerned about the people I know who have no access to God? And if the answer to those questions is yes, well, that's a very good sign that your roots are alive. And I say this to you this morning because we know that access to God is what everybody on the planet needs. Far more than they need the vaccine, they need access to God. And we know that that is Jesus' top priority. How do we know that access to God is Jesus' top priority? Because that's why he went into Jerusalem, to die on the cross and open the way to God. And I can't think of a more important and urgent priority for you and I to embrace this Christmas than that. So let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you that you want all people everywhere to be saved. We thank you that you've made access to you possible by the death of your dearly loved son. 
And we pray that the privilege of this access would be real to each person listening this morning. And we pray that your business would be our business. And we pray that by your divine power, you would make us instruments of truth and love through this week, through Christmas, and into the new year. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.